Well, thank you so much. It's a tremendous joy to be with you. So enjoyed the worship and uh, our preoccupation with Jesus and many wanting to take part. Uh, I just love uh, being uh, just plunged into that atmosphere of worship. It's such a blessing when you're going to preach to find people who uh, love Jesus together. Uh, it's a blessing always to come back. And uh, I've not brought my wife with me, but I brought some books she's written. Okay, So there's a book uh, table on the right, back there as you leave. And uh, there's one called The Spirit-Filled Church, uh, the only one there that I've written, but I just commend that to you. It's describing the kind of church we want to be, and uh, I just believe it's helpful to us. Then my wife's written a book called His Strong Hand, which actually the publishers came to her saying, please would you give us a book that uh, could be like a coffee table book or bedside uh, table that you could just look into. You may feel, I'm not really much of a reader don't spend much time reading. Uh, Well, this book's ideal for that kind of person because the chapters are only like two or three pages long and they're very, very interesting, fun things to read. And and she's got a real skill to describe how Jesus comes right into life. I love that video. I really thought it was an excellent video. And these different people in their different uh, life situations uh, bring God right to where they are, which is God's whole purpose, to come and be amongst us. So she's got... Uh, chapters like the, uh, the Open Door, A Daughter's Decision, In Praise of Older Women, Wedding Anniversaries, Notes on Worship, Babies, Daffodils and Other Smells, Rugby for Grandmas. It's a, a fun book. I re- recommend that to you. I believe you'll really meet with Jesus. I found when my secretary uh, first put it on my desk, I couldn't stop reading, just one after another. It's really, really good. And then a very different book, which has just, just been published, uh, of mine are... Uh, it's really a gospel story, and if you've recently become a Christian or you feel I'd love to get certainty in my heart, then I believe it'll be really helpful to you, but also it's a book with regard to neighbors, friends, contacts, people you just love to speak to or you just feel, I don't know quite more, what more to say, I'd love to you to know about Jesus, would you like to read this? And it's only pound fifty, so it's cheaper than a Christmas card, so... I just want to encourage you, you may have two or three in your handbag, ladies, so just to be ready. So when you get a chance to speak, you think, oh, I don't know what to say. Would you like to read this? It'll only take them like 15 minutes to read, but I believe it can have impact and uh, really help people. So there's a whole box of them back there. Please uh, have a look at them. I had a letter from a, a Church of England minister recently, because it's only just been published. He said, I'm getting a 1,000 for my people to give away. So that's terrifically encouraging. It's an opportunity to share with friends and neighbors and so on. So that one's on the table as well, all over there on the right. Now I'm going to speak to you from Second Kings. If you want to follow Second Kings and chapter 7, let me just give you a kind of background to the story. Uh, it's a, one of those, I, I'm reading through Kings myself at the moment, and it's a weird book. Uh, it's like one battle after another, one rotten king after another. Um, it's just, it gets almost boring, so many bad guys, and you think, when's something better going to happen? And then you get suddenly interventions from God from time to time. Suddenly God comes in uh, into a history, which from, from Solomon on is kind of downhill in Jewish history. And uh, you get these prophets saying, come back to God, come back to God. And then you get these battles sometimes where God just steps in. And this is such one. And uh, so in the previous chapter, which I'm not going to read to you, uh, you'll find that this city is being besieged. One of the ways that they would make war in those ancient days, they just cut off all supply to the city. And instead of just storming it, they just wait for the people to to just run out of food, run out of everything. And, and, And the description of the city is pretty horrific in the previous chapter. It's like, there's, there's no hope, it's all over, forget it, you know, we're all going to die. And uh, then you get this uh, extraordinary prophecy from Elisha, and I'll just read the first, uh, I think, uh, 10 verses or so, okay? Second Kings chapter 7, from verse 1, then Elisha said, listen to the word of the Lord, thus says the Lord, tomorrow about this time, a measure of fine flour will be sold for a shekel. Two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. The royal officer, on whose hand the king was leaning, answered the man of God and said, 
behold, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? Then he said, behold, you will see it with your own eyes, but you will not eat of it. Now there were four leprous men in the entrance of the gate. And they said to one another, why do we sit here until we die? If we say we'll enter the city, then there's famine in the city. And we'll die there. If we sit here, we'll die also. Now therefore, come, let's go over to the camp of the Arameans. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, we'll die. They rose at twilight to go to the camp of the Arameans. When they came to the outskirts of the camp of the Arameans, behold, there was no one there. For the Lord had caused the army of the Arameans to hear a sound of chariots and a sound of horses, even the sound of a great army. So they said to one another, Behold, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites, the kings of the Egyptians, to come upon us. Therefore they arose and fled in the twilight, left their tents, left their horses, their donkeys, even the camp, just as it was, and fled for their life. And when these lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they entered one tent and ate and drank and carried from their silver and gold and clothes and went and hid them and then returned and entered another tent and carried from there also and they went and hid them. Then they said to one another, we're not doing right. This day is a day of good news, but we're keeping silent. If we wait till morning light, punishment will overtake us. Now therefore, come. Let's go and tell the king's household. Pray. Lord, thank you so much for your wonderful ability to transform situations on a grand scale or in our individual lives. And Father, we, we just do come singing our praise. We come worshipping. We come, Lord, with gratitude as we've looked upon, Lord, this video and, Lord, been reminded of people whose lives were Lord, it seems almost wasted, lives that were poured out. Lord, we do give thanks to you for, Lord, people who had the courage and, Lord, who put others first. Lord, we're staggered when we ponder it. And, Lord, when we see these faces and uh, we realize these are just people like we are. And, Lord God, we, we just do honor you and we just thank you for your mercy to this nation. And, Lord, and we do long that we might be more worthy of the mercy you've shown us, Lord. And Father, we just pray right now for the Holy Spirit to lead us, guide us. Please let this ancient story come alive to us, Father. Let it, let it do us good, please, Lord. Come with power from on high. Help us, we ask, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I don't know about you, but I often in the mornings while I'm having breakfast, listen to Radio 4, the Today program, catch up on the news, hear the various discussions that are taking place. And I remember not long ago hearing John Humphreys speaking to a Christian minister. I don't know who the minister was now. I can't remember who it was. But as he was talking to him, uh, at some point he, he talked about the Bible being a book about morality. And uh, the Christian minister said, no, it's not. Uh, and uh, John Humphreys was, uh, kind of laughed in amazement. He said, I never thought I'd hear a Christian minister saying that the Bible isn't a book about Christian morality, about morality. And the, and, the, and the vicar said, no, you've got it completely wrong. He said, the Bible is a book about how God intervenes powerfully to save people. That's what it's about. I thought, oh, well done, man, well done. Because so often people think... But, you know, what is your religion? Well, it's about being good and, and not doing these things and those things. It's just a list of things, rules and regulations, uh, days you have to honor, things you have to turn up to. I mean, it's just about a duty thing, isn't it? And, and this guy was saying, no, no, that's not it at all. You've missed the point. The point is we're in a terrible state and God intervenes and God has magnificently actually once and for all intervened even in the matter of death and life and eternity. God has broken in. God does break in and change things that look impossible. 
That's the wonder. That's what the Bible's all about. And it's interesting that again and again, you get stories running right through the Bible of when that happens. And it's all pointing forward to the great time when it will happen, when Jesus came and actually beat death and broke it in and gave us eternal life. And we know he's going to come again at the end of the age. And we heard some of these references, you know, when God will bring in peace everywhere and usher in a whole new age. Hallelujah. And, and, and we thank God for a God who breaks in, God who intervenes supernaturally and changes things. And for some of us, that, that, we could say, that's my testimony, it's certainly mine. My life was a total mess. I was going downhill fast. My, my parents were not believers. I, I never had any opportunity to hear the gospel. I didn't go to church. I didn't, I didn't pick up Christian literature. But my sister went to London to go on the stage, she hoped. She'd been to drama college. She's, and, and Billy Graham came to London. And she came home and said, I've become a Christian. And God broke in on my silly little life and changed it. He broke in. He completely transformed it. That's what the gospel is about. It's about a living Christ who breaks in and changes everything. And so that many of these stories are getting us ready for that. So some famous stories like the Exodus, the story of how the Jewish nation effectively almost sort of began. It began with their, their all slavery. God had made promises to their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. But now for hundreds of years, they've just been in slavery, getting beaten up, being tortured, working hard, no hope, no hope at all. And then suddenly God breaks in with incredible signs and wonders, raises up Moses and the sea opens and they come out and they become a people. It's their history. They came to birth by a supernatural intervention from God. That's their story. And then as you look again, you find, hey, the Philistines are overwhelming them at some point. And there's a great giant called uh, uh, Goliath who's just absolutely dominating them. And then we hear about this teenage kid who gets raised up and takes him out and everything changes. And there's so many stories like this in the Bible, one after another, which just shows that no, no, God is a God who sovereignly breaks through. He changes everything, he intervenes supernaturally. And I believe all these stories are getting us ready for the one great intervention when Jesus came to deliver. Because this story is like that. It's one of those stories. So let's just remind ourselves there, uh, it's a city. Uh, it's being besieged. There's a much more powerful army than Israel. And, and, and gradually, the food's running out. I mean, the story is horrific. That they're without food, there's, they're always talking about cannibalism. I mean, it's a dreadful e earlier chapter. I mean, we're dying. There's nothing to eat. There's nothing to drink. We're gonna just, just going to die. And then suddenly, Elisha, as I read to you, said, hey, tomorrow, tomorrow, food will be cheap. Everything will be fine. Tomorrow... Our drama is behind us. It's all going to finish, all over, completely finished. And you had that little conversation where this officer said, oh, it's impossible, it can't happen. And the guy says, well, you'll see it, but you won't actually receive it. Your unbelief is going to rob you of the enjoyment of this experience. And that's what happens in the story. This guy actually doesn't, he just gets trampled on as people run free. His unbelief held him back. It was a terrific warning to us because these wonderful deliverances come through a, a faith that's a yes, Lord, a, a kind of yes to God. It's important that we have that in our hearts. Say, Lord, you can do it. You can change things for me. And so here we get this story and it says, uh, it's going to happen. It'll all be over. And then the story turns, interestingly. You think, well, who's going to do this? How's it going to happen? Are there going to be great angels coming through the sky? Or is there going to be a special kind of SAS unit? Or you remember how David at one point said, if only I could drink some water from the well that's in Bethlehem. And you get the story of these courageous young guys who say, let's go and do it. Let's break through. And they're warriors. They're, they're tough guys. Well, this story turns instead on four lepers. Four lepers are outside the wall. And, and the situation would be this, that because of their leprosy, they're not allowed to mix with people. The, the, it was the most feared sickness in the Old Testament. And, and it, people thought, it's terribly contagious. 
And so they were, they were left outside. You're not allowed in. And they were made unclean and everything. You're outside. You're outside the city. And people would just let food down to them. And robes and baskets. They would just let stuff down to them. And these four guys are going to die. And because there's no food left in the city, there's nothing coming down. And the story turns on these four guys. It's a fascinating thing. Without these four guys, there is no story. And it turns on these four lepers, and it's interesting that they are kind of dead men. They've got nothing to live for. And they have this conversation with one another. Well, look, we're going to die sitting here. And if we go into the city, we're going to die because there's nothing there. Why don't we just cast ourselves on the mercy of that army? Because what, all that can happen is they can only kill us. We're going to die anyway. That's a kind of strange logic. It's like, we're finished. There's no, there's no alternative for us. And as I'm reading this, I thought, I thought, this is amazing. People who've got nothing else to live for are pretty dangerous people. People who don't treasure their lives can do all sorts of things that most of us wouldn't do because we've got other agendas. Other things that matter to us. There's a big question like, what if? If we do that, what about us? These guys, there's no more us left. (laughs) It's like, so what? And and, I'm just thinking about that. And I'm thinking, even as we were singing our beautiful songs this morning, I'm thinking, I stand, hands raised, (laughs) arms high, heart abandoned. And we're hearing verses like, if you lose your life, you'll find it. If you find your life, if you cling to it, you'll lose it. And, and you know, Jesus said that as kind of one of the keys of what it is to live the Christian life. It's like, it's like you know, you listen to all Jesus' parables and stories, and you see he's healing the sick and all kinds of stuff. Then it gives you this, look, listen, listen, this is a big thing for you. If you want to find your life, lose it. If you lose your life, you find it. You find it. That sounds, that sounds enigmatic, to put it mildly. But when you look at this story, you find four guys who've already lost their lives. They've got nothing else to live for. And people who've got nothing else to live for are very powerful. They're very dangerous. They could, there's nothing they can't do. And that's what this whole story turns on these guys, because they've got nothing else to do. The turning point of the whole story. They have become reckless. And as I thought about that, I thought, actually, that's the tone of New Testament believers. There comes a point in the story of Apostle Paul uh, where he's traveling and he wants to go down to Jerusalem. And the people say, don't go there, it's dangerous for you. That would be so dangerous, Paul. For you. you know what happened when you were there last time? You know how unpopular, they hate you. If you go back down to Jerusalem, the Jewish people will get hot. You'll be in terrible danger. And this is his answer. He says to them, I don't regard my life as of any account or as dear to myself that I might finish my course, the ministry I've received from the Lord. They're saying, hey, you're too important for us, Paul. You've got to save your life. He said, no, 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 I want to give my life. I don't count my life as dear. And that was something that happened in the early church. That was the atmosphere of the early church. And to be honest, it's the atmosphere in a number of different nations now. We just heard of a a woman who's been let out of prison in Pakistan. Eight years she's been in prison because she just happened to talk about Jesus to some people in the line. I met, I met a guy who was 25 years in prison in China. I went to, see, I went to smuggle Bibles into uh, China some years back, and I met a pastor, and he said, when I was 44, uh, they put me in uh, prison. He was 21 years, 21 years in prison, and, uh, and he's got six kids. And when he was 44, they took him and put him in prison. And I've got five kids. I thought, wow, what would it be like? He didn't... When he was 65, they said, well, oh, he's finished now, let him go. And and his wife had raised these six kids. She had been offered by a number of men, godly men, I'll marry you, look after you, look after your kids. And she said, he he might still be alive. I've never heard that he died. He might still be alive. And she waited and waited and waited. When he was 65, he said, oh, he's finished. I met him when he was 82. And he came to the hotel we were staying in to collect Bibles. I mean, radiant, absolutely radiant. And I said, you suffered so much. He just beamed at me. He said, 
Nothing compares with Jesus. Nothing compares with Jesus. Just radiant, bright. And then I read, I read in a Christian magazine a little later, his name was Alan Ewan. And it said, Alan Ewan was under house arrest again because he'd baptized 400 people on one day. <laughs> He's like 80, 83 by then, you know. They let him out when he was 65. He's finished. Boy, the guy was full of life. But he was so useful to God because, well, hey, nothing else really matters. Nothing else matters. It says in Corinthians, if one died for all, therefore all are dead. He died for all so that they who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and rose again. Knowing Jesus, knowing what it cost him, changes our value system, changes our whole perspective of life. We, our life depends on someone who threw away his life. And Paul says, that doesn't leave me as I was before. It's not just nice to know about. It's radically affected my values. It's changed who I am. It changes how I look at things. So it says in Galatians, I glory in the cross. Now, we, we can be a bit sentimental sometimes, you know, the old rugged cross. But Paul says this, I glory in the cross of Christ by which I've been crucified to the world and the world's been crucified to me. You see, when we think of the old rugged cross, you know, oh, I, I just glory in... No, 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 he's not talking about that. He's saying the cross by which I have been crucified to the world. And the world's been crucified to me. It's affected me. It's affected how I value stuff. And what value I put on lesser things. So it's almost like, would you like to do this? Yeah, I would love to do it, but what about my reputation? What about my popularity in the workplace? All these places we saw on the screen. You know, there's the girl working at the desk, but there's all sorts of other people in that open office. There's a guy working in the farm. He's going, but ooh, if, I, if I name Jesus, ooh, I could be ostracized, that weird religious guy. You know, what about my career prospects? Oh, you're a Christian. Oh, one of those weird guys. You mean promotion? <laughs> Forget it. You see, all sorts of what if. What about my financial security? What might happen if? What about the kids? I was only single when God called me to leave my secular job. But I didn't have anything to do. And I thought when I left, I thought, hmm, I'll probably never get married. Because I was going to go and live by faith. And how can you ask a girl, come and be part of this? So I had to leave that with God. I said, Lord, you know. You know, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going. Because I feel you called me, I feel you called me. And, and I, I, so I was in a meeting, I'm praying about it, praying about it, praying about it. Do you want my life? Do you want my job? And I felt God was speaking to me more and more. And I, and I was going back, this is going back years, before the charismatic movement had barely started. And I used to steal away sometimes to a Pentecostal church. I thought, well, I may be here from God. And there were two prophecies, one that's I'm looking for those who give themselves to prayer. And I thought, that's what I know God's speaking to me about. But how can I? I mean, I've got, I leave work at seven. I leave home at seven in the morning. I get home at seven at night. It's a demanding job. I go up to London every day from Brighton. I do this. I thought, well, how can I? How can I? And then the second prophecy came. said, those who put me first, I'll look after them. I gave my notice the next day. I left work in 63. I thought, well, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't think I'd get anybody to get to marry me. It's one of the things I thought, well, hey, I've got five kids and 19 grandchildren and a wife. <laughs> <laughs> and a wonderful story to tell of God's infinite mercy. But I, there came a point, I thought, you see, so often we say, well, I would do it, but, yeah, I'd love to do that, but, yeah, I'd love to, but what about, see, these four, there's no what about. There's no other agenda. They don't have another agenda. They're dead. We've just been hearing this verse. They should lose their life. Find it. Find it. And these, these dead guys become the key to the whole story. Beloved, when we get these values right, only God knows what key you can be to a story. It turns on guys who've got no other agenda. So they are as good as dead. You see, that's how the whole story starts. God comes to Abraham and says, leave your land, leave your father's house, come into a place. Hey, what about? What about my land? What about my reputation? I'll be just a wanderer. 
I'll just be a wanderer. I heard a tremendous pr uh, speaker at the uh, uh, West Point, the Commission Conference in the summer, Andy McCulloch, who's a terrific preacher. He's uh, also lived in the Middle East, and he understands the Middle East culture. And he says, in the Middle East culture, what you own, your, your, your father's background, uh, your land, that's what gives you identity. Got, they've got no respect for someone who's got no roots. They're just a rolling stone. Poof. It's a man, a stone in his right place is who he is. And honoring his father is a big deal. God says to Abraham, leave your father, leave your land, and come to a place. Of, wow, that's huge. It's much bigger than I realized when I heard that Middle Eastern philosophy. Leave everything. What? And follow me where? To a place. Huh? And that's how, beloved, that's how it started. Come, follow me to a place. Okay, here we go. And it says, Abraham's the father of all who believe. The whole story rolls on from Abraham. The whole deal. Jesus said to the disciples, hey, leave your nets. Follow me. Because they left their parents in the boat. James and John working there with his dad, their dad. Where, where to? Follow me. Well, what? It's called the way. What's that? It's trusting me. See, beloved, we're believers. And, and when you get this offer of life, which is going to go on into eternity, not just a short, you know, not a little bit of church going, everything, our values are changed, radically changed. We live for different values because we know we're going to live forever. We can't lose. We cannot lose. That was one of these letters. This last week, thinking about this war has been a big deal, hasn't it? More than usual, I feel. Because some of us have lived through this for many years. But somehow, I, read a, I heard a, a letter being read from a guy who just said, writing to his wife and saying, well, my darling, if I don't see you again, I'll see you in glory. I mean, a clear Christian didn't know what was going to happen to him. But when you know, <laughs> when you know, when you're certain about eternal things, and we know we're going to live forever, <laughs> everything else, the value system changes. But I can't buy it. No, it doesn't really matter. But they've got a better, well, it doesn't really matter. But can't we get the latest? Well, maybe, maybe not. doesn't really matter. But we won't have so much prestige. It doesn't matter. I'm going to live forever. These values just change things, profoundly change things inside us. What really matters to us? And these four guys, hey, it doesn't matter. They've got nothing to lose. Not only that, they knew they had nothing, but they also knew the city had nothing. Which is another thing we need to realize. Paul says at one point, Demas. Now, Demas is a guy that you meet in a number of Paul's epistles, his letters. And he often says, Demas sends his love. Although, what's that effect? Demas sends regards. Demas. So Demas comes up a few times. And then the last time he's mentioned, in 2 Timothy, Paul says, Demas has left me, having Fallen in love with this passing age. <coughs> He's worked with Paul. I mean, what a privilege to be with the Apostle Paul on his ministry, his tours, seeing all the miracles, and the whole thing. Just that. He's with Paul. And then suddenly, hey, that looks good. Suddenly, everything out. You, you know, I've been in ministry long enough. Do you think, what? He did what? He's gone? But he was, yeah, I know, he's just. I don't know what happened. I think he got a job offer. I think. He's gone. Wow, how did that happen? He loved this, past, this passing age. He's loved it. He's got, he lost it. He thought there was something in the city. Something in the city. No, there isn't. It's dead. These lepers knew there's nothing in the city. And beloved, we know that. There's nothing in the city. This world offers nothing. Nothing of worth, nothing that can help us or change us. It says about Jesus in Hebrews 13, Jesus, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the city. So let us go out to him, outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no lasting city. We're seeking one to come. Our citizenship's in heaven, from which we await the Savior. We've got another location, another identity. We have another citizenship. It's changed everything. 
And beloved, that's going to be more and more real. When I was born again back in the 50s, my sisters, I've become a Christian. My answer was this. We're all Christians, aren't we? That wouldn't be the answer anymore. People don't take that for granted anymore. And only God knows how hard it's going to be to be a Christian in our nation. It's going to be more and more tough until God breaks through in power. We need to know where my citizenship lies and where my hopes lie. Our citizenship's in heaven. So these guys, they're pretty clear on issues. They've got nothing to live for. Hallelujah. <laughs> We're free. I was, in, I was in a church in Kingston for five years. I moved back to Sussex recently. And one of the elders, he said, God's called me to Turkey. He's got a wife. He's got four little children. But, but uh, and his parents, and I, what are you doing with your life? God's called me. I've got to go. You're crazy. Yeah, he's out there now. Learning the language, beginning to form a church. But that means that you're going to throw away your job, your security. What about your kids? What about, what about, what about? Hey, God's called me. He's off. He's there. I visited him in Istanbul, started a church. Tough place to be. Oh, God called me. The values are clear for him. If we lose our life, hey, we're free. We can find it. We can find it. So that's how it starts. It starts with guys who are clear on the issues. Are we clear on the issues? Being a Christian is not an easy thing anymore. Second thing I noticed is this extraordinary discovery. See, they stumble on a phenomenal thing. You see, like I said about Moses, Moses is coming out of Exodus, he's coming out of Egypt. Ah, oh, there's, the, there's the sea, we can't go any further. I mean, it's amazing. They've had the Passover's been slaughtered. The blood's been shed. God's showing the mercy sign. But we can't get any further. We're locked in. Then, woof, the sea opens. That's amazing. They're through. Then they get into the land, and there's Jericho. Wow, look at that. It's walled up to heaven. That's, that's, that's the end of that then. Forget it. It's all gone. No, no, no. Walk around it. Shout. It's gone. Yeah, again and again. No, God does it. God breaks through. And so in this story, they go out to look at it. And as they're getting there, I imagine what it was like. They're, they're kind of tiptoeing along. Let's go. Imagine the conversation. What shall we say? I don't know. What we just walk? Can we just walk together? It's dark, pitch dark. We're waiting for the sentry. Who goes there? You know, waiting for it. Walking, walking, walking. Where's this? There's no sentry. What's going on here? And what they don't know is they heard... They heard something from God. Like a great army is coming. Supernaturally, God let this whole crowd hear like there's an army coming. And so they ran for it. It's as they ran without their horses even. They're just gone. They run. It's ridiculous. They've left everything. And so these lepers come on. And instead of finding guns and whatever, arrows, they, they find a camp that's got nobody protecting it. They stumble on this extraordinary thing. It's all there, this amazing, amazing reversal. It's all there, we're okay. All our, all our needs are being met. Look, look at look how much stuff there is. It reminds me, it reminds me of Mary Magdalene. Imagine Mary, Mary Magdalene when she's coming to the temple, she's coming to the tomb. I mean, these guys are coming. What are we going to find? We're going to get killed. What are we coming to? What? She says, I go and find his body. I, I, I know he's dead, but the thought of living one day without him. I mean, they've taken away my Lord. I don't know where they put him. Suddenly, Mary, ah, he's alive. He's alive. This dead, this empty tomb. Everything's changed. This. Wonderful Jesus, I saw him crucified. He's alive again. That's the wonderful, wonderful, the biggest one of the whole, that Jesus came alone. So these four lepers suddenly stumble on it. It says of the early believers, they couldn't believe for joy. He's alive again. I want to try and imagine that sometimes. What would it have been like? This incredible thing. Incredible thing. Now I just want to get into the story. It says they went into the tent and they found clothing, and they found food. I mean, they found gold, they found silver. 
I mean, this is expecting maybe we'll get killed. And instead, they find this extraordinary stuff. And I, I just looking ever so slowly going through this, it says they were eating, they were drinking, they were wearing, they were gathering, they were hiding, and then they went to another tent and did it all over again. Imagine these guys were starving. Absolutely starving. They're just outside the city. And the food stopped coming down. And it wasn't much fun when it did come down. Stuff that nobody else wanted. And now there's... I mean, it's like, can you imagine? Look at this. Have you seen what... Wow, look at this. And, and have you tried? Hey, have some of this. And all four of them just opening stuff, eating it, eating it. Gold. Hey, gold. And clothes. Hey, look at... How do I look in this? Fantastic. And it says they took it, and then they went and hid it. And then they found another tent. And there's some more. There's a whole army full of stuff. I was once... I was once... Um, Told, I was in Portsmouth, a church there, and the guy told me about a, a Christian bookshop. I, I, I like reading Christian books. And he said, the second-hand Christian bookshop. I've never seen such an incredible bookshop. Amazing resources. They told me where it was, and I, and I went there. I couldn't believe it. I mean, it's just high. No other books, all Christian books. Used to be one like it in Brighton. It closed years ago, sadly. But I thought, wow, look at that. I mean, all Spurgeons and all Bunyan. And, and look, there's a whole section, a whole set of Lloyd-Jones on this. And I mean, some of it's almost good, almost new. It's the second half. But I think, wow, wow. I mean, I'll have that. And I'll have, I'll have, I'll have that. I'm, I'm, it was just phenomenal. And I phoned my son, Joel, uh, one of my boys. And I said, I said, Joel, I'm in Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. <laughs> Honestly, I said that to him. He said, well, Dad, what are you talking about? And so I told him what I found. I said, you would not believe what's here. And the prices, I mean, it's all phenomenal. I was so excited about it. I went out with armfuls of stuff. And the funny thing was, a little while later, I had a phone call from my son. And he said, Dad, I had to come down to, I had to, come down to Portsmouth. He said, uh, actually, I was in a meeting. And as a, you know, like a good guy, I turned my phone off. And I came out, and there's three messages from my son, Joel over a period of time. And the first one says, Dad, I've got to go to, South, uh, to Portsmouth today. Uh, you tell about that bookshop? Where's that bookshop? And there's a second one. Second, uh, second uh, message. Uh, Dad, I'm in Portsmouth. Come on, where's that shop? I can't find that shop. And then there's a third message, and it says, I'm in there. <laughs> LAUGHTER <laughs> well, It's like that. It's like, whoa. <laughs> See, that's what it's like for these guys. Look what I found. Look what I found. And they're just so excited. That, and it says that they are enjoying the spoils. Now, when I, I started reading this thing, and I thought about spoils. That's a word that doesn't really occur to us in our modern urban life. In fact, we're coming up to Christmas, and there's a very famous passage which you may hear in the weeks ahead. Uh, where it says, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. That's in Isaiah chapter 9. And it's prophetically speaking about Jesus. And then it says this. He says, you will increase their gladness. It talks about this light that's going to come in the darkness. People who sat in darkness will see a great light. It says, you will increase their gladness as with the gladness of harvest, as when men rejoice when they divide the spoil. Now, sometimes our Bible is kind of a bit strange, isn't it? You know, harvest. Well, we, we used to do Harvest Festival when I was a kid. Harvest, we, we, you know, we don't think of, I don't think of harvest anymore. I go to the supermarket. It's on the shelf week in and week out. I'm not aware of harvest. In a rural society, you know, everything depends on the harvest. It's just like the harvest is gone and we're not, it didn't work this year. I mean, it's devastation. Uh, for farmers in that real world, it's devastation. For me, I go to the supermarket. So I read a Bible verse like that. It's like, hmm? So what? The harvest? That doesn't bother me. It's not, so the Bible is it's written in another culture, and sometimes it doesn't sort of speak like it could. You know, it's like, it's just they'll rejoice like that when you have the harvest. Like when you come home from Tesco's, oh, wonderful. No, it's there. It's going to be there next week. 
And, and it's always there. So, so this verse doesn't captivate me. But if harvest is a bit weird, dividing the spoil is not something we don't get into. What is dividing the spoil? Well, this is what it is. Armies were not paid wages in this period. Armies fought battles. And what they got was theirs by right of conquest. So you think, what's this army doing with gold and silver? I oh, no, that's it. They're, they're, they're going, and they've probably fought a few battles, and they've accumulated all this stuff. And that's the spoil. We won the battle, so we get the spoil. That's very important, friends, because when I thought spoil, to my amazement, I looked up the word spoil in my concordance. You know, concordance shows you every place where a word is used. And I look up spoil. There's loads and loads of references to spoil. Pages and pages of it. By why? Because again and again, it talks about win winning spoils in battle. So there's a very famous battle, another one like this, where it says in 2 Chronicles 20, they went out to fight a battle, and God says to them, you don't even need to fight. And they send the choir out first. Some of you may know that famous story in 2 Chronicles 20. And they send it, and it says, they win this battle. It's just the choir goes first, like your Christmas choir. Okay? The choir goes first. And they just win a great battle. And it says this. It took three days to collect the spoil and the garments and the valuable things more than they could carry. Three days to gather it. Three, it's similar when David fought a battle at one time at Ziklag when he's beaten and, and everything's stolen from him. Everything's gone. And he said, what shall I do? And God says, go, everything will be recovered. They went and got the stuff and loads of other spoil which this army had. And it's theirs because they won. Beloved, this is what this verse... See, all these battles and things, they're all meant to tell us about what God's done in Christ. I hope we recognize the spoils. I hope we recognize the things we got all free. Like perfect, spotless righteousness, all free. That I believe in Jesus. I, I, have no, I have no guilt at all. All my sins have been forgiven. Isn't that amazing? I'm righteous as a gift. I mean, I've been a Christian for years thinking, I hope I, hope I prayed long enough. I hope I read my Bible enough. I hope I'm earning some points. I hope God's happy with me. No, 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 no. It all comes with the spoils. Jesus won the battle. We get all the spoils. He shares the spoil. It says he will share the spoils with the strong. It's wonderful. He shares the spoils that come from his victory. It's all free. Because Jesus died, we go free and we get... See, it's not like you have to earn it. You say, well, I'd love to be filled with the Spirit. Well, it's all free. What do you mean I don't know you don't have to do anything? Just come and drink. That's what it says in the Bible. But surely you have no, you don't have to do anything. Just come. It's part of the spoils. You want to be filled with the spirit? I've prayed with people sometimes, you go down the line, receive, they receive, come to receive, they receive, come to the next one. I don't know if I'm worthy. I say, of course you're not worthy. I'm, I'm, maybe God's waiting for me to be. How long are you going to wait? It's free. It's free. It's part of the spoils. It's, it's all free. The whole thing is free. It's the spoils of his triumph. He won a great victory. And we can put on these clothes and say, hey, I'm righteous. It's a good deal, eh? It's free. And God accounts me righteous, not because I prayed a lot this morning or I read my Bible verses. No, no, it's all free. I could have overslept. I'm still righteous. Still righteous. See, sometimes we're driven by our conscience. Now the blood of Jesus cleanses my conscience. He makes me free. Hallelujah. He gives me the motivation to keep going. Why? Well, he's declared me righteous as a gift. I think so many... See, I've, I, I must rush on because time's going. What time do you finish? Just five minutes ago? Okay, so... Okay, I'll, I'll try. I forgot what I was going to say now. But we... We can often feel, have I done enough? Is, is, this, is this available? The believer is someone who's found spoil and it's all free. Because Jesus won a battle. When David went out against Goliath, the army was a load of losers. We're all losers. We're going to lose. This guy, Goliath, he's look at him. He's nine foot tall. 
We're losers, we're losers. David goes out, kills Goliath. We're winners, we're all winners. He turned an army of losers into an army of winners by beating the enemy. That's what Jesus has done for us. We're righteous as a gift. See, sometimes you hear this story preached, and I'm not going to go there, but the end of the verse says, it's true, we should keep silent about this. Let's go and tell. And I've only ever heard this passage preached on that, the last bit. Let's go and tell, go and tell. But beloved, I often think people are going to tell and they're not yet amazed at what they've found. We don't look like people that, wow, what happened to you guys? On the day of Pentecost, it's like, what happened to you guys? Oh, heaven, we got the whole deal. Preaching on the day of Pentecost was explaining how full we are. How excited we are. What's happened to us? It's all free. It's all free. And we just need to know it, beloved. Otherwise, we miss the point of all these stories. How did they get through the Red Sea? God opened it. How did they take down the walls of Jericho? God did it. How did they win this battle? God did it. And how do we get rid of our guilty conscience? God did it. How do we get free? God's done it. We died with Christ. We've been raised to newness of life. God's done it. All the way. And my last point I must make quickly is the children beginning to appear. On the day, or a few days later, it says this. Peter is at the temple and there's a cripple who's been there for 40 years. And Peter says to him, he says to Peter, got any money? No, I haven't got any money. Such as I have, I give you. Look on me. It's a story. And Acts 4, such as I have, I give you. Get up and walk. Where did you get that from, Peter? Where did you get what I have, I give you? Get up. Where, where did you, where would you mean you have it? Where did you get it from? Well, I earned it. How did you earn it? I cursed and swore and said, I don't know Jesus. You did what? Yeah, I let him down. When? Oh, about three weeks ago. You did what? Yeah, I said, I don't know him. I'm not with him. But you're totally disqualified. You're a waste of time. No, actually, I'm justified freely as a gift. I'm thoroughly restored to Jesus. I've, 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 I'm back in his favor. He called me his brother. And what I've got to give you, get up. Beloved, the early church understood what they received freely. Freely. You can't, you say, how long does it, how long do you have to wait to earn the right to do that? No, you didn't have to wait at all. And how do you earn it anyway? It's a gift. It's the gift of God. I just want to encourage us. Yes, of course, the story ends. Hey, this is so good, we should tell, tell everybody. Yeah, of course. But most people I've heard preach this, it's like, now you must go. Well, yeah, we'll do that as well. But let's enjoy. Let's enjoy. There's a guy called Bhakt Singh. He was a Christian in India. And he went with a group to go and look at Mount Everest. And he went with this journey, and they went to that, and they stood at a particular place where they're going to see Mount Everest. And they're standing there looking. And he looked at it, and in his mind, he's strangely disappointed. He said, I don't understand. I'm just kind of... I'm kind of disappointed. And others are saying, well, I've done it. I've seen it. I've seen Mount Everest at dawn. Wonderful. Seen Mount Everest at dawn. That's memorable. Put that in my bucket list. I've done it. And the group are beginning to get fidgety. Time to move. And the guide comes to him and says, we're moving on now, sir. He said, yeah, okay. And the guide understands. He said, look, look, if you just wait a few minutes here, you can catch us up. Everybody wants to move on. You can catch us. Just wait here. This is the way we're going. This, you catch us. Wait here. And he said, I was standing there. And he said, suddenly, the morning mist lifted. And he said, it was as though the mountain took a huge step forward. He said, ah. And he said, I saw Mount Everest at dawn. He said, there are 20 other people somewhere in the world who are saying, I saw Mount Everest at dawn. They didn't see it. They didn't see it. I saw it. Beloved, the stuff we must see. Open the eyes of our hearts, Lord. We might see. My wife took a photograph of an American autumn leaves. If you've ever seen the American colors are breathtaking. Just a, a 
fabulous picture. And we bought a frame and I put it in just a week ago. A week ago is what comes to mind. Put it up, put a frame around it. And a funny thing, we, we looked at it and said, I don't know, I'm a bit disappointed in it. I couldn't understand why I'm disappointed with it. Because when it was on her phone, I thought, wow, look at that picture. Got it expanded, put it in. There it is. And then my son came to stay and he said, that picture of yours, yeah? He said, that, that glass over the front, do you realize it's got a film on it? I said, no. So he took the whole thing apart again and took the film, cut it off this, and the picture, <gasps> wow! Beloved, we need to see. Don't think I know, because we may not know. And Paul prays, I'm praying for the eyes of your heart to be open. We might know what we found. We may know what we found. Let's close. I'd like to pray for any, can I pray for any? We close the meeting. If any of you have got lower back pain, I'd love to pray for you. Lower back pain, maybe pain goes down your sciatic nerve as well. Lower back pain, neck and shoulder pain, I'd love to pray with. And if, if any of you have got arthritic knees, I'd love to pray for you. All right? But we'll close the meeting. We won't sing or anything because I've gone over time. But we'll just, Lord Jesus, I want to thank you. What you've done for us is so massive. So massive. And we do confess, Lord, that I confess, Lord, I know I've not seen everything. I, I think of Peter just saying, I've got it. You can have it free. How did he get that? He shared the spoils of Jesus' victory. And Lord, we do, I want to pray for your church, pray for your dear church here, Lord. Keep blessing the church here. Thank you for what you have done. Thank you for, Lord, people being saved, healed, added, the church growing. We're grateful, Lord. And we just want to be a people who've seen so much that our eyes are popping out of our heads, that we can't we to eat this fabulous food, put on these wonderful clothes, take this wonderful gold and silver. Lord, all that you give us, Father, Lord, we just pray, please, Lord, keep opening our eyes to what you've done. Let us share your spoils, Lord. We know you're so generous, Lord. Thank you for the spoils of your victory. We want to share them. We believe we'll honor, glorify you more by really making a big thing of the spoils you've won for us. So please bless us, Lord. Bless us as we go through this new week. Let us live to the praise of your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We must close. Very patient children are waiting. If you've got lower back pain, I'd love to pray for you. I'll say a few more words. You come and take a seat down here. If you've got arthritic knees, if you've got a head, you can't move your head or something like that, I want to pray for you. Would you just take a seat here and I'll come to you and speak to you. Otherwise, there's coffee, I think. Yes. Coffee. Good filter coffee. Amazing books. Fellowship. All right. Or healing. <laughs>